My name is Pete Pinnell, and I teach ceramics here at UNL. It's been my pleasure over the last three years to get to know, to get to work with Max, and I now have the honor of introducing Max as a newly minted MFA. Max graduated from Dobson High School in Mesa, Arizona, where he worked with his first ceramics teacher, Brooke Faust. I understand that Brooke is here. He graduated from the University of Arizona in 2019 and then spent a year as a special student at Penn State University. Max has earned two competitive residencies to begin his professional life. This summer, he'll have a residency at the R.G. Bray Foundation in Helena, Montana, and begin this fall to be a long-term resident at Red Lodge Clay Center in Red Lodge, Montana. I'd like to mention several people who were instrumental in supporting Max and helping him to reach this important milestone and who are here today. And I'm going to go through a list, so let's just save our uh, applause for the end. His parents, Tiffany, and ready. Uh, his high school teacher, Brooke Faust, Max has told me that her teaching and support were the reason why ceramics became so much more than a semester long class. Uh, John Domenico, who founded the La Serra Collective in Denver, um, Max said he, John always challenges him to transcend what he believed were his limitations. And finally, Brad Clem, who Max describes as a straight-up homie. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Max Henderson. Great. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Maxwell Henderson, and apparently, I'm officially a Master of Fine Arts. <laughs> I was born in 1996, and I'm the youngest of four half-brothers. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay, yes. cool. Great. Um, if you can't tell, by the way, I'm the one on the top left. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not. Um, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and I say Phoenix because no one knows what Mesa is. Um, but my childhood was, uh, to be honest with you, pretty difficult. I did grow up in poverty, and I struggled with comments on like my racial ambiguity. I had loved ones who struggled with drug addiction, and I watched many of my friends fall into the same cycle. I really struggled with my self-worth, and I often still do, uh, but the first time I felt conviction in my self-worth was when I first touched clay when I was 15 years old. I took ceramics my freshman year because I didn't care for art, to be honest with you, and I was just trying to get my art credits out of the way, and honestly, I didn't feel that art was for people like me. So. When I was in school, everything came to me pretty easily. I was a straight-A student, um, but the thing that captivated, captivated me by making pots was because it was one of the first things that really challenged me, and I had this need to really figure it out. By the way, that's the first bowl I ever made, and my uh, teacher from high school, Brooke Faust, helped me with this piece after school. So I stuck with it all through high school, knowing damn well that I would do this for the rest of my life. Um, during my senior year, I began applying to college. I was certain I would go to Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, about 100 miles away from where I grew up. Um, but while I was volunteering at this place called the Mesa Arts Center, um, a resident artist there named Brad Clem or something like that uh, suggested that I apply to the Kansas City Art Institute. So I did. And I got in. And they offered nearly $90,000 for me to attend. So I was like, forget Northern Arizona, I'm gonna come here. Um, but weeks before I was supposed to move there, 
I discovered that I was still going to be $50,000 in debt, like for undergrad. There was no way I was doing that. Um, but unfortunately, all the housing at NAU was no longer available. So I went from believing that I was moving over 1,200 miles from home to two miles. <laughs> And that's how I ended up at Arizona State University. And I was so bitter. Not that I thought that ASU was a bad program or anything, but it's because I felt confined to a home that I was adamant to escape. Um, I didn't know this then, but this helped me realize that when something doesn't immediately go your way, it's okay to feel upset in that moment, but just know that it'll inevitably manifest into something beautiful in ways that we can never predict. At Arizona State, I focused primarily on utilitarian pottery. I spent a lot of time soda firing, which is this process of spraying dissolved, a dissolved sodium solution into an extremely hot kiln. And that sodium solution will volatilize and act as a glaze for the pots. And I was enamored by the work of Matt Long, and I shamelessly mimicked his work by applying fluid clay to the surface of my pot. And while I was at ASU, I met this weirdly ambitious dude. <laughs> I met this weirdly ambitious dude named John Dominico. And he asked me, hey, you want to come to Denver this summer to help me finish this massive kiln I'm building? I stupidly but enthusiastically <laughs> said, yeah. <laughs> so I went. And it was the most strenuous, humbling, exhausting experience I had to date. And just a little hint. Uh, the most strenuous, humbling, exhausting experience I've ever had was actually last summer when I stupidly found myself back there doing the same thing, but we'll discuss that later in the talk. So summer 2016, we spent the summer building stressfully trying to complete this kiln. I was scraping skin off of my Achilles and breaking toes. Apparently, you shouldn't be wearing chacos when you're doing laborious work. <laughs> And this summer, I learned that I did not want to be a production potter. And I bitterly vowed to never return to the balustrade vineyard. <laughs> so for most of my undergrad, I solely focused on soda fire pottery. I really enjoyed the process, and I simply didn't have enough money to buy clay for larger work. Um, but to be honest with you all, uh, undergrad was arguably the most challenging depressing moment in my life. Um, at, the point, at this point, I was in a tumultuous relationship, and during that time, I lost my sense of individuality, I lost my self-worth, and I lost my studio time. Um, and because of this, that's why we're going to go from this slide from 2016 and 2017 straight to 2019. Things became so bad for me that I had to make the most difficult decision in my life and leave my relationship. I did this during my final semester of undergrad, and I was on the brink of homelessness. But one of my closest friends, Chris Polensky, and his sister Aya picked me up from a Denny's parking lot at 3 a.m. with all my belongings strapped to my body. <laughs> he and his family invited me to live with them until I graduated from undergrad. Um, but before I move on, it's important for me to note that my partner of the time was a very kind human being, um, but border person. Borderline personality disorder is an um, unimaginably difficult mental illness for her to live with. Um, but this was the first time in almost three years where I had the time and energy to focus on myself. I like to say that the best mistake of my life was not making a plan B. I have to be an artist, so I got to work. I made my entire thesis show in nearly two months. And not only was this difficult to do, even with the best circumstances, but it was even harder because our soda kiln was condemned to demolition because that thing was a hazard. Um, so I couldn't rely on the research and the processes that I spent three years working on in undergrad. But everything worked out. We had a very successful BFA exhibition, and I was accepted to a month-long work study at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts in Tennessee. Um, and this was perfect because I was definitely ready to leave Arizona. The only problem was I'd never been able to afford a car. And it's weird how things work out. A good friend of mine, Hans, Hans Miles, offered to give me his old car, which was abandoned for two years. The battery was dead. 
the tires were rotted, the AC was shot, um, the motor mount was destroyed too, and the windows didn't work. The interior was covered in dust. And I guess that's what happens when two years worth of these had passed through it. I had a week until I was supposed to be in Tennessee. But I was determined to move on. So after a deep clean, I spent most of the tens of dollars that I had saved to fix it up. <laughs> I packed my belongings that I had, and my friend Chris and I got into the car, and the gleams of my taillights faded east to find myself a better life. I don't know if any of you know Death Cab for Cuties. I don't registration check out some. <laughs> and even though this car shouldn't have traveled more than three miles, I forced this bad boy to travel over 3,000 miles. And that's how I ended up in Tennessee. Um, I don't know if I can articulate the fearful excitement I felt to those who have never experienced a cir uh, circumstance like this, but if you do know, then you know. And honestly, being here brought me to tears. I never experienced a landscape like this being from Arizona. And it made me realize all that I wasn't afforded to for over 22 years. And while I love the community at Aramont, I would frequently sneak off to the Smoky Mountains alone. And yes, I am introverted, but after three years without a sense of individuality, this was my way of re reconciling my lost time. I was honored to participate in a workshop with Matt Long, and even more honored to share this experience with my friend Chris and Augusta Smith. And before I knew it, my time at Aramont was setting. Like I said, it's weird how things work out. When and what I mean by that is I was only an hour away from my grandma who I grew up with. And even better, my mom was there at the same time visiting her. So after a couple of days with my grandma, my mom and I drove to Arkansas where she moved a year prior to rebuild her life in the same way I was trying to do for myself. So she bought a small coffee shop that's running stronger than ever now. And um, just a few days after getting back from visiting my grandma, she did pass away. And while that was difficult, we did continue on. I spent the next month hanging out with my mom, running her coffee shop, helping her run her coffee shop, she was doing it herself, <laughs> and continuing to experience landscapes I had never had access to. I even got to drive to Denver to watch two good friends marry each other. Now, I didn't take any pictures, and I'm not calling you a cow. <laughs> <laughs> But I did take this picture of these curious cows when I was driving back to Arkansas from their wedding. And just a few weeks later, in late August of 2019, I left Arkansas. I visited my dad and his wife, Shelly, in Indiana. And shortly after, I arrived at Penn State as a post back student. Now, unless you're familiar with the Clay community, you can never understand how honored and how intimidated I felt to work with Christopher Staley. He has impacted my work and how I view my humanity since I was 16 years old. And when I tell you that I was fangirling, I was fangirling. <laughs> I swear that was Halloween. <laughs> and weirdly enough, I found myself crying again in a forest. I had never experienced a true autumn, which is my favorite time of the year. And for years, these landscapes that were once a fantasy for me were now becoming a reality. Being here reminded me that I deserve to be content, that I deserve to have experiences that I yearn for, that I deserve to love life. And I didn't know what that felt like. And I felt so proud of myself because I wouldn't have had these opportunities without the bravery of acting on my agency to make difficult, uncertain, compelling decisions. And I even got to horse it. <laughs> like, what? That was crazy for me. And you can tell how snow deprived I was from this image of what I call <laughs> the aftermath of a blizzard. blizzard. That's literally one snowflake. In fact, <laughs> that actually might be styrofoam. I don't know. <laughs> I got to see the fantastical phenomena of freezing rain, and I learned that 20 degrees isn't nearly cold enough to freeze a pond to sustain body weight. And yes, I did fall into a pond. <laughs> um, but while I was at Penn State,
state, I was feeling anxious because I didn't know what I would do after. But everyone there convinced me to apply to grad school, even though I felt I wasn't good enough. So I began making work. And the work was good, but my photography was terrible. I can't express the embarrassment I felt when I saw this image in a reputable ceramics magazine. But guess who came in clutch? The homie Andrew. <laughs> homie Andrew. Andrew showed me the power of high quality documentation. And let's just say grad school was not gonna happen if I was taking my own images. So knowing that I had the support of those at Penn State, I continued making work. And every now and again, a little voice in my head told me that I wouldn't be accepted. But every time Andrew documented my work, I would look at it and be like, no, I'll be good. I'll be good. So at this point, I was living on the coins in my change jar. And I remember crying in a McDonald's parking lot late at night when I went to pay for a McChicken, which was like $1.19 at the time. Um, and I realized that the highest denomination that I had in my jar were dimes. But because of this, I only had enough money to apply to three schools. And once I felt the relief of submitting my applications, I began experimenting by applying low temperature glaze on top of high temperature glaze as a way to control the glaze flow. And this cup actually is the foundation of the work that you'll see at the very end. And in March of 2020, Margaret Bowles called me to tell me that I was accepted to UNL. They graciously flew me out to Lincoln where I accepted their invitation to join the program. I already knew that I was joining, but I was like, free flight, why not? Um, <laughs> sorry, Margaret. Uh, <laughs> we have the funding, don't worry. I felt so ecstatic, and I felt so worthy, too. And I felt everything was falling into place. But guess what also happened in March of 2020? What? Oh. <laughs> that, yes. Finding ourselves in a once in a hundred years pandemic was terrifying. We lost studio access, I lost my job, and all I could ask myself was, is Penn State gonna refund my tuition? <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> but like I said, when bad things happen, it'll inevitably manifest into something beautiful in ways that we can never predict. And a week after losing studio access, we started an art collective in Brad Clem's studio uh, basement called Be Well Collective. We were adamant about staying productive artists during this uncertain time. But that did not last long. Instead, we rested. We explored. I got to see my first apple tree. I got to pick my first strawberries. We took nature walks and smoked from a tobacco pipe, which is not my thing, by the way. <laughs> we made plenty of food, and we made plenty of drinks, enjoying oceanic views in front of Brad's TV. <laughs> and yes, we still made work. And I am just happy that I appreciated the privileges of this moment as it was happening, and I feel that is something that we collectively neglect to do. But in late May, George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis police officers. And I just began thinking about our culture, and I'm frustrated by the bigotry and the complacency of our society, and I simply want nothing to do with it. But this also made me think about my own biases and my own limitations. I began thinking about my work and the things I would roll my eyes at. As my way of being more open-minded, I decided that when I arrived to Lincoln in a few months to start grad school, that I would use my time to make work that reflected aesthetics and processes I was once critical of. Those months passed and I found myself here at UNL. And it's crazy to think that that was three years ago. I lost a lot of hair since then, anyway. <laughs> and it started off absolutely wonderful. <laughs> no, but really, it did. I feel so much gratitude for this program and for those who are a part of it. It was the first time that I could make as much of my choice of desired play as I wanted. I had health care for the first time in six years, and yes, I am holding my feet. <laughs> and I got to experience what real snow was like. <laughs> I was lucky enough <laughs> to meet a fantastic, beautiful, amazing, cherished, and did I say beautiful human being? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to repeat it. And I was a seven hour drive away from Denver, the place I vowed to never revisit <laughs> just five years earlier. But here I was, October of 2020, firing that damn wood kiln again. And during my first year of grad school, I made terrible work, terrible work. 
absolutely terrible, but hey, at least they were complimented by my terrible photography. <laughs> and at this point, I was really hoping that my faculty knew that I knew that I was making terrible work. It was hard on my ego, but this was purposeful. Because like I said, after George Floyd, I vowed to challenge my biases and make work that I was critical of. And during this time, I was actually in Margaret Bowles making history class where we replicated historical objects. And I didn't know this then, but this was a window into what my thesis show would become. I became increasingly infatuated with Japanese futani porcelain, which is a process of applying low temperature glaze over high fired porcelain. They remind me of these Icelandic rivers that I discovered in high school. I remember being about 16 years old, sitting on my half deflated air mattress, using my family's shared bulky laptop looking at these images of Iceland. I was particularly drawn to them because they were an, an antithetical fantasy of the desert home that I felt confined to. And I really enjoyed their similarity to Japanese Kutani porcelain, like the melding and the flow of colors captivated me. And no matter how much aesthetic explorations I do during my time here, I knew I was going to stick with this Kutani thing and figure it out. So I began doing meticulous research, trying to decipher esoteric articles on X-ray diffraction chemical analyses on historical Kutani shards. I don't know what that means. And this cup was my very first attempt. And it turned out terrible, but I was thrilled regardless. I spent months trying to figure this out, and I seemed to get closer and closer. But to be honest, I didn't really enjoy the process of painting these glazes on three-dimensional pots. Also, the colors seemed too much of a spectacle, even like nauseating on these cups. So I went to Menards, which is like our Home Depot here, and got some small commercial bathroom tiles to glaze. And this was my first tile, and it was mind-blowing to me. But the glazes were incredibly flawed. They bubble, blister, and I had no idea how to solve that without drastically altering the qualities of the glaze. So while I'm figuring this out, I continued exploring vessel forms. I play with the relationship of contrast through form, texture, color, value. I kept playing with materials that were novel to me, like these goopy glazes that seem to be investing, I mean, influencing the ceramics community. And inspired by Andrew, I vowed to become better at photographing my work. And thanks to him, this was the first time I felt proud to see my work in a magazine, all one square inch of it. And opportunities to explore new landscapes kept coming to me. I was invited to teach at this prestigious summer arts camp for kids and being around children of millionaires of Manhattan was definitely a culture shock, but nonetheless, they were fantastic people. And while I was there to teach, I couldn't help but escape every evening to take nature walks in the nearby forest. It became like a ritual. And after teaching, I'd go into the forest as the sun began to set, and I'd leave before it completely got dark. That's when this got lost once, I was terrified. Anyway, and did I cry in the forest again? Yeah. And I couldn't help it. The space was beautiful, and it reminded me of how much I had to overcome just to simply stand here and take photos of these homes that I was thinking of robbing. <laughs> I even had the opportunity to visit another clay hero of mine uh, in upstate New York. Uh, if you don't know Francesca D'Amadio, please check out her work. You'll love it. If you don't, I disagree. <laughs> and weeks later, my time ended there, and it was time for me to get back into the swing of my second year of grad school. And to be honest, I was scared to push my work. I didn't know what I was doing, and it felt safe to make maquettes. It was my way of justifying why the work was bad. Like, oh, don't worry, they're just tests. But then um, I learned that my ex-partner from undergrad had actually ended her life. And after dealing with that, I just began to think of what I went through to get here. So I told myself, yes, you can continue making uh, maquettes, but you need to start making so I did. I drilled 900 holes in this vessel. I rolled out 900 sticks of glaze, and yes, that is glaze. And I pulled this out, of the, uh, this piece out of the kiln, and I just thought it was like absolutely stunning. And I was like, this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my time here. I began thinking about how to merge my earlier explorations of pottery with my current like sculptural curiosities. And again, I began reminding myself that I can appreciate exploring novel processes, but that doesn't mean I need to neglect my roots in pottery. So I started thinking about how I could meld these like goofy glazes with my pots. And it was great and all, but the novelty kind of faded. And 
my work and processes began to feel like a redundant crutch. Um, but in the background, I was still exploring these glazed tiles. And here's a little short story for you. I was informed that there were these large two foot by two foot porcelain tiles at Lowe's. So I went and bought one, glazed it, and I was so excited for the results because the largest tile I had before was like six inches by 18. And then I opened the kiln to this. And when I tell you that I had a panic attack, I was three breaths away from a stroke. <laughs> but hey, like I said, when something bad happens, it'll inevitably lead to something beautiful in ways we can't predict. And you remember that place in Denver I vowed to never return to? Well, John calls me up one day and he's like, hey Max, want to build an addition to the wood kiln? And I was like, no. And John says, yes you do. And I say, you're right, I'll see you in May. Over the years, this wood kiln on the property of Balistrary Vineyards has actually transformed into a nonprofit art collective called the Sara. And I'm honored to say that I was the 2022 summer resident artist there. And we built this damn kiln on top of an already 25 foot kiln, and we sourced mortared covered brick from the kindest woman you'll ever find. And did you know it's not that fun to grind mortar off of a brick, <laughs> let alone hundreds, if not thousands. And as you may tell, there's plenty of work to do there. Like clean the inside of the Anagama from our firing from October of 2020. <laughs> Remember those slides? <laughs> but John's inspiring. He's someone who finds value in work and ambition and transcending limitations. And it's apparent in his work too. So much so it inspired me to do the same. And I'd be lying to say this wasn't the most intense summer of my life, but we fired that kiln and personally, my work looked like crap. <laughs> but Casey Beck, he got some beautiful pots. But then again, what's new? <laughs> OK, I did get one beautiful pot. And despite having one good pot and I had hundreds in there, um, inspire the vessel that you're going to see upstairs. And now that I'm giving this talk, I honestly don't know why I didn't include that piece in. But um, without this piece, without this experience, you would not be seeing this or this, or this, or this, or this. Sorry, I got distracted making mock cuts again. My bad. And while I was making these vessels, I had the privilege to learn about clay and glaze from Margaret Bowles and Pete Pinnell. And because of them, and because of my unexplainable need to figure out these glazes, I finally did. Just in time, too, I figured out my process, my recipe, and definitely my kiln loading. No more ruining kilns. <laughs> you know, it's pretty easy to just give up when things get difficult, and it's easy to avoid uncertainty. But despite spending over two years experiencing failure, I kept trying. And for some reason, I did. And honestly, I'm glad that I did. It makes me think of who'd I be had I not made difficult decisions and endure uncertain circumstances. And to be honest, I don't know if we want to meet that person. Thank you.
process when you're selecting the colors that you like to choose to make your glazes? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I try to think about color compositions that I think would be beautiful, but then you keep coming up in my mind, so that's kind of like not, that's not how really things work out. Um, but <laughs> I take photos of um, images of things I notice in life. You kind of see those in the slide talk. Uh, but I just try to look for like color schemes and whatnot. And honestly, this like process of like understanding how colors pair well together has been really informative for me. Even so much so that I was actually help helping you figure out your EDC outfit too. And I was like, oh, you should add like a little pop of color with your fishnet leggings too. You know. So it's like I do this for myself, but it ends up benefiting. Also those Icelandic rivers, I really try to recreate those. Um, so that's another color in, in, uh, inspiration. Yeah. Did I answer? Oh, did I see a question over here? One more question and then we'll move upstairs. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you had like a, 
an outside stranger experience, maybe on the bus, a train, walking down the street that like really impacted you as an artist? Uh, one of like maybe they were imagined or something very in particular that they told you that really spoke to you and made you experience something? One time, I got done teaching class here, and I walked over to Chipotle to um, pick up some food. And while I was there, I, I saw this like homeless lady, and uh, I was kind of sitting there eating, and I felt a little guilty. So I went back, and I bought another container of food for her. And I like walked up to her, and I gave it to her. And then she just like kind of started talking to me, kind of sharing her her story and like the traumas that she went through and the fact that she existed in Lincoln to just pursue a better life. And we were just kind of talking, I wasn't expecting this, but just that conversation with her, it just reminded me to like always do things you're scared of kind of thing, um, do the things that you're uncertain about, uh, don't become complacent and like try not to be too comfortable all the time in a way, and it's just like, my favorite thing is that you just run across strangers and they're always going to impact, like not always, but they'll often impact you in ways that like you never anticipate. So I really encourage engaging with people who might not share your values or people that you might feel intimidated to talk to because you never really know what you're gonna get from having a conversation with them. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, I'm tired of answering questions. But uh, I just wanted to say, oh, I guess, I guess my dad has a question too. <laughs> I'll make it short and sweet. We are very proud of you, and we love you very much. I love you too. You did a great job. Thank you. I love you too. how many times it gets scanned because we have a website we can access. So <laughs> please take time with our shows um, and thank you for taking the time to come here. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll move upstairs now. Great.